Our text today, what we're looking at in Scripture, helps me realize that that's not the only picture of great faith. There is also great faith that normal people who aren't in life and death situations can display every day of our lives. What we're going to look at today is one of the oddest scriptures in the whole Bible. I mean, really, one of the most weird scriptures I've ever read, one of the most difficult to interpret. I I just read it and scratch my head. With one of the most mysterious, maybe the most mysterious character in the Bible. And we're walking through the next few weeks the book of Hebrews chapter 11, which is this great hall of faith. And there's this one odd character right at the beginning of it. And we want to look at this guy as the next few weeks we see pictures of what great faith means. And this is really sort of, how do you have great faith in the midst of the mundane routine of life? Okay? Here's the text. Hebrews 11, verse 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now this Hebrews 11, we're going to be there the next few weeks Actually, all over the world, there are people all over the Aryan nation world on the same text and, and, and ideas of great faith. But 21 times in Hebrews 11, that phrase, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, 21 times. 20 of the 21, by faith, is followed by an action verb. One of them, it's not. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than his brother. By faith, Noah constructed an ark to save his family. By faith, Abraham went from his city, nation, people to another one. By faith, Abraham offered Isaac. You get it? By faith, something amazing was done by a person. By faith, Joseph gave directions. By faith, Moses' parents hid him. By faith, Moses left Egypt. It goes on and on and on. 20 of 21, by faith, it's by faith, something was done. In other words, faith is not just an idea between the ears. Faith is something that moves one foot in front of the other, and there's action taken. Faith is not just something we believe. It's something we believe that causes us to do, right? Faith is action. But there's one 20 out of 21, by faith, something done. But the one is the one we're looking at, this mysterious guy Enoch and this strange verse that describes him. By faith, Enoch was taken up. That's not something he did. He's just standing there and he floats up. Okay, I don't know. By faith, so that he should not see death. By faith, he was not found because God had taken him. What in the world does that mean? Hebrews 11, besides the by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, do something, it's also a sort of a primer of Israel's Jewish history. It's sort of a list of the great heroes of their faith. The list obviously includes Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Gideon, David, Samuel, Joshua, although he's not mentioned by name, but his exploits. And the list goes on and on. And so in this list of the usual suspects, okay, who are the great heroes of their nation, Abraham, Noah, Moses, David, Enoch? Wait a minute. I don't know what Moses did while he's on the list, but Enoch? I know why Noah's on the list. He saved the people, but Enoch? Why is he on there? 
Think about a great list. Let me give you a list. I won't even tell you what the list is. You'll know it. Marcus Mariota. Timmy Chang. Colt Brennan. Tua. I can't say his last name. Tua. (laughs) Tua's little brother. Jordan Ta'amu. Ole Miss. Boo. Mackenzie Milton. You know what this list is? Great Hawaiian quarterbacks. Mariota, Cole Brennan, Tua. But the list goes on. Mackenzie Milton, Norman Nakanishi. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Now you go, wait a minute. I know why Mariota's on the list, but who is this Nakanishi guy? Why is he on the list? That's exactly how the readers of Hebrews 11 felt 2,000 years ago. Noah, Moses, David, Samuel, Enoch, Norman. (laughs) I understand why these other people are on the list. I do not know why Enoch is on this list. What did he do? Ah, there's the question. What do we do to get on God's list. Boy, that's the, question of the, that's the question of the age. What do I have to do to be on God's list of favorites? We all have an answer for that, of stuff that we think if we do this, then God favors us. If we don't do this, God doesn't. Remember I said this text is one of the strangest to me in the Bible with a mysterious character, but it even is more mysterious and strange, the Old Testament account. So, you know, we can look at these people on this Hebrews 11 list, and he says, by faith, Noah did this. We can go back and read chapter after chapter after chapter that explains what Noah did, and then we see why he's on the list. Abraham, we can go back and read 20 chapters more and, and actually, we're reading about 40-some chapters about Abraham and his, and his family. Okay, I get it. So you see, you get this Hebrews list and then go to the Old Testament, and then it, it, it fills it out, and you go, ah, oh, okay, that's why. Wow, amazing. But when we do that for Enoch, we go back to the Old Testament, boy, we have to look really hard to find what does it say about him. It's not a chapter It's not a chunk of Scripture. It's not a whole book like Joshua. Okay, Joshua's on the list. Let's go. Oh, there's a whole book. Tells all the stuff he did. Okay, no wonder he's there. There are six verses about Enoch that are equally strange. Here we go. Genesis 5. Let's see why Enoch. What did he do? Why is he on that list? Verse 18. When Jared had lived 162 years... He fathered Enoch. So what do we know about Enoch from that? He was born. How many of you were born? (laughs) You might make the list. First qualification. Here we go. Look at the next one. Verse 19. Jared lived after he fathered, fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. So what does that tell us about Enoch? He had siblings. He had brothers and sisters. How many of you have brothers or sisters? That's two. You might be on this list. (laughs) This is not as hard as we thought. Next verse, 20. Thus all the days of Jared, remember that's his father, were 962 years and he died. Now, pause there. In Genesis chapter 5, it's interesting. It lists people, I don't know, more than a dozen different people, and it gives a sentence or two about them, how long they lived and how many kids they had, that kind of thing. And then it always says, and he died. And he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. It's kind of like by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith in Hebrews 11. In the Genesis 5 one, it goes so-and-so, and he died, so-and-so, and he died. And then we get to Enoch. He's the only person introduced in that chapter, and it doesn't end by saying, and he died. 
Well, what does it say? Father died, 21, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Ah, okay, he had kids, he had a child. He married, it doesn't say that, but that's the implication. So he was born, he had siblings, now he has a wife and a child. Verse 22, where are we? 22, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. So he was born, he had a dad, he had siblings, had a wife, and he had a bunch of kids. Does that sound like your life? Some of you go, that's me. I'm Enoch. But it gives us a hint in verse 22. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. So here he is. He's a parent. He's a child of his parents. He's a sibling. He's a husband. He's got a bunch of kids. And in the midst of that, you know what he did? He walked with God. While getting lunch ready for school for however many kids he had, while getting one to soccer practice and the other to football practice, while helping with homework, while making a run to Walmart or Target to pick up another box of diapers, while doing the stuff of life that children and spouses and parents and siblings do, in the midst of that, the mundane routines of life, not the Chinese pastor who turned himself into the police to preach the gospel at the precinct. That's amazing. That's superhuman. That's supernatural boldness. That's great faith on steroids. That's not me. I would have run to the U.S. Embassy, not the police station. But this guy... Being a son, honoring his father, being a husband, being a father, being a dad, doing the stuff of normal everyday life. In the midst of that, it says he walked with God. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 24 says it again. When the Bible repeats itself, it's never an accident. When I repeat myself, it's because I forgot I already said it. <laughs> when the Bible repeats itself, nobody forgot anything. There's a reason. Verse 22, he walked with God. Verse 24, Enoch walked with God. Hey, wait a minute, you just said that. Yeah, I want to make sure you get it. He walked with God and he was not. This is bizarre. He walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Where did he take him? I don't know, but he was walking with him. So what do we know about Enoch? To make the list in Hebrews 11. I know what Noah did. I know what Abraham did. I know what Isaac did. I know what David did. I know what Samuel did. What did Enoch do? What in the world did he do to make that list? He was born, he had brothers and sisters, his father died, he had a son, probably a wife, he walked with God, had a bunch more kids, he was not, God took him, he walked with God. Okay? What does it mean to walk with God? Yesterday morning after breakfast, you know, we flew from east to west, from Nashville to here, and so we woke up at 4 a.m., I felt real spiritual. The Lord woke me up, or jet lag did. Either way. So we're up. We're walking down by the beach, having breakfast. And at breakfast, actually, we walked down there to have breakfast. And after breakfast, during breakfast, my wife said, let's go for a walk. And then she said, but not one of those exercise walks. Let's just go for a walk. And so we did. And we walked along the beach. The sun had just come up. It was cool. It wasn't hot. There was hardly anybody out there. It was beautiful. We walked. Part of the time we talked. Part of the time we didn't. We just walked. Part of it was very slow. When we watched, we would stop and observe the beauty of God's creation. We walked. But there are other kinds of walks we had done together. Just the day before... We landed in Atlanta on our way here, the busiest airport in America. Doesn't matter what time you land in Atlanta, it's chaos. 
And so we landed, I think it was like B-38, and we had to walk from B-38 to the train and then walk from there to E-16. And if you've ever been to the Atlanta airport during rush hour, which is 6 a.m. to the following 6 (laughs) a.m., it's always rush hour in the Atlantic airport. People are not nice. And so the walk, dragging luggage, elbowing, tripping people, boxing out, fighting to get on the train, it, it's, it's brutal. It, it's, it's a war, okay, going through Atlanta airport because there's a mission here. We have to get from this terminal and this gate to that one to get on that plane. Nobody is stopping me. Hope nobody asks me if I'm a pastor. <laughs> Taking the stickers off the luggage. <laughs> Because this is a myth. This is a walk. We're walking together. We're going to make it. We've got a goal. We've got a timetable. We are doing this together. We're getting on that plane. No matter how many small children we knock over on the way. I'm exaggerating a little bit. You understand there are walks we do together sometimes. It's mission. We have to get something done. And we're walking in. That's one kind of walk. That's not the kind of walk my wife wanted on the beach yesterday morning. She didn't want that kind of walk. There are other times we walk, and it's a power walk to get the heart rate up, to get the blood flowing, to burn some calories. It's an exercise walk, and we're out. We're, we're checking according to the little thing, how many steps we took. And it, it, she cheats, though. She's only five feet tall, so we can go from here to the back of the room, and she has taken double the number of steps I have, unless I walk like this. It's the only way, because anytime we walk in that, she always wins. I'm going, of course you took more steps, because your steps are like that, and mine are like that. She took more steps in the exact same distance. I don't know what that measures, how many steps. It's an irrelevant number. But that we do is exercise walk. Got to get those steps in. So there's mission walk. There's something to accomplish. There's exercise. We have to do this to stay healthy. But then there's the kind of walk we did yesterday morning. It's a relational walk. There's no mission. There's no health thing we're doing. And when it comes to health, let me, t- let me tell you the truth. I hate exercise. I absolutely hate it. But I also hate dying and being sick. So I do it. I know it doesn't look like it, but I do. Okay, I have to, I have to exercise four days a week just to be this out of shape. <laughs> you know... If we think about walking with God, there are a lot of ways. Sometimes our walk with God is about a mission. Sometimes there is something that we have to do. There's a deadline. There's a goal. We're walking with God, and this is the result. But if that's all your walk with God is, you're missing something entirely. You're missing the point. That's part of it, but that's not the core. There are other times our walk with God is a discipline so that we stay healthy. We get up and we read the Bible. We get up and sometimes it's life giving and sometimes it's not. But it's the discipline of spiritual health. But if that's all our walk with God is, is ticking a box and putting in our time and the word and prayer, we're missing out on what really walking with God is. What walking with God, I think it's talking about here, is what my wife and I did yesterday morning. There was no goal There was no monitoring the heart. The whole point was just to be together. Where we went was irrelevant. How long it took us was irrelevant. The heart rate was irrelevant. The calories burned were irrelevant. How many steps taken were irrelevant. The fruit of it was irrelevant. What was accomplished didn't matter. All that mattered was walking together. That's what Enoch did. He walked with God. Did he sometimes have a goal to accomplish? Probably. Did he sometimes have a discipline of it? Probably. But yet it was that relational walk. You know when Jesus called his disciples? When he said, come follow me? You know what that literally meant? What they did? They walked. They walked everywhere they went. 
They didn't have a chariot. They walked. Come follow me. And for the most part, it was that relational walk. Sometimes there was a goal. Sometimes there was a discipline. But most of it was a walk to be together. Jesus called those 12 and appointed them that they might be with him. Then that he would teach them how to cast out devils and heal the sick and all of that. So there was a point at some point. But the primary was just to be with him. What does great faith look like for normal people like us? You're kind of looking and going, well, I don't know if that person is normal. But for most of us, most of us are not charging the police station and saying, arrest me too. Most of us are not living in Pakistan, the third most dangerous country in the world. For, we're not. So is great faith possible for people like us who live normal lives? I say it is. Enoch was a son, a husband, a father, a sibling who in the midst of the routines of life figured out a way to walk with God in the midst of it. Hebrews tells us what that looked like. By faith, he used his faith to please God. You know, my first trip to your island was 1979. And I was part of a summer, I was a college student at Mississippi State University, and I was part of a mission trip here to the University of Hawaii campus. For one month, we were out ministering to students at UH. It was three weeks before I realized there were beaches here. We were just on campus ministering. And the guy leading the outreach to the UH campus back in those days <clears throat> was fresh out of the military. He was in ministry at the time, but he had been in military. And boy, he ran everything like the military. He thought we were all training for the military, I think. But he said something I've never forgotten. When we would come back from our ministry assignment and have a debrief, if somebody happened to have a bad attitude or somebody did something that really was stupid, which we were teenagers doing outreach, so there was a lot of stupid we were doing, the guy never raised his voice. He never seemed angry, but he would say something like this. He would say, Steve, you know, the attitude I saw when you did this, that attitude doesn't please the Lord. And he would bring correction in a way that made it between me and God. Now, I look back and I think sometimes I don't think God really cared. I think it just didn't please him. But what he did was pushed everything back to are you pleasing God or not? Not is the task being done, but is it pleasing to God? I've never forgotten that lesson. And I've, I've had deep in my soul somewhere a thing that says, I, I just want to please God. But what we see here that pleases God, it's not the stuff we do. It's the faith. Do we trust him? And pleasing him, walking with him, that's what it is. We walk with God every day. We put our trust, put our faith, put our eyes on him. Don't look at the people doing these great exploits, these great heroes of faith, and compare yourself and go, wow, I'll never measure up to that. I'm glad you won't because you're not supposed to. All you're supposed to measure up to is by faith. Be a good son to your father, good daughter to your father. That's what Enoch was. By faith. He found a wife. He had kids. Do that by faith. Whatever your role in life is right now, do it by faith. Trust God. Don't compare yourself to Moses and Noah and Pastor Norman, Billy and Parrot. Don't compare yourself to, the, to the, those people. Just put your faith in God. Hear the word of Jesus saying, come follow me. That's a walk with him. That's all he wants. Follow him. Walk with him. You know, in Matthew, when Jesus was being baptized, this is the last thought. The voice came from heaven. And it's, you know what it said? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus hadn't done one miracle. He hadn't fed anybody. He hadn't walked on water. He had just been a faithful son, doing his business, being a carpenter. God was well pleased. Some of you need to hear that today. He's looking and saying, you're my daughter, you're my son, I'm well pleased. 
Not because you did some mighty exploit, just because you walk with him. You're conscious of him. You're spending time with him. You're desiring to please him. Lord, thank you for the call to walk with you. Thank you that you've invited us to this relationship. Not because of our deserving of anything. Not because we've done something amazing. But all because you did something amazing for us on the cross. Thank you for the invitation to walk with you.